hearts are right, we want to share the message of salvation. But Jesus said, love one another. Mm -hmm. Love people like I have loved you. That's the way to the kingdom. Right. Welcome to Bible Connection, the podcast where we talk about the Bible and how it connects to every facet of life imaginable. Hey, welcome to Bible Connection. My name is Philip Nation. I have uh, the distinct pleasure of being able to serve as the Bible publisher for Thomas Nelson, and I'm here today with Kathy Lee Gifford. It is an unusual, unique, and wonderful opportunity that I get to talk with you today. Oh, Thanks. Thank you. How nice. <laughs> I'm not always received that way, so I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I have my doubts that that would be the case, but I, really, I had the opportunity to sit down and and walk through the Jesus I Know, this book that you're you're publishing, and just found it to be so incredibly fascinating as you talked with friends that you've been friends with for some for decades. Decades. Some. And, and, and some, some brand new. And some brand new friends. And so I want to dig into that a little bit of how you were discovering their walk with Jesus. But I think it would uh, certainly be appropriate to start with your own. Can you help us to remember the moment in your life where you came to that personal knowledge of, okay, now I know Jesus? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was, I was 12 years old. And I'd gone to into Annapolis, Maryland. We lived outside of Annapolis uh, because Billy Graham's organization had put out um, their first film to much flack and much uh, um, uh, uh, sh um, shredding of clothing mm. and ripping out of hair. How dare you? You know, I'm a, a, a pastor and a, and, a, and a man of the gospel and an evangelist used the airwaves, mm. the movie theaters where, where you know, Satan lives. And I loved Billy. He'd just go, well, no, 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 no. Now God owns the airwaves. Mm. We, if, if Satan owns them, it's because we gave them over to him. Yeah. Let's take them back. Let's use everything God gave us. Because he had learned through his, his, his ministry and television how powerful the medium was mm -hmm. to reach millions. Mm -hmm. Probably in the history of the entire world, no one will have reached more souls for the, the gospel than, than Billy because God gave him an understanding that there is no secular and spiritual. Mm -hmm. There is God's cosmos. Mm -hmm. And he so loved the world, all of it, that he gave his only begotten son. And I think we just do a total disservice to, to God and his purposes in the kingdom when we put limits on things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was, saw this movie, and I, I remember hearing the voice of Jesus, a little Jewish girl, a uh, Jewish father, uh, a shiksa mother, at home, not knowing much about anything in life except for that I was on the cusp of becoming a young woman. Was I going to go the world's way, or would I take a different path? Yeah. And I felt Jesus say, "Yeshua." I became to know him as his Hebrew name. Mm -hmm. I heard him saying, "Kathy, I love you, and if you'll trust me, I'll make something beautiful out of your life." Now I think it's interesting that that Jesus, Yeshua, God met me right where I lived and breathed. Mm -hmm. From the moment I came out of my mother's womb, because I was made in it, and those dreams were formed in it, and before the creation of time, Scripture tells me, and everyone else who cares deeply enough to go read it, I knew what I wanted to do. I was going to put on shows. I was going to write movies. I was going to write music. I was going to sing. I was going to sing. I didn't know how or where or what, but there was no other path. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus said that to me, it forged the path more clearly for me. And I raced up there to receive him. And, and, and he led me into a very different kind of mission field. Very few people go into it, say, oh, that's where God's going to use me. It, it, the networks. Oh, <laughs> God's going to use me on Broadway. Oh, God's going to use me in, on, a, on a film set in Scotland with an atheist friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Or God's going to use me at recording songs with, with the guys that are drunk and making passes at me. God's going to use me there. Oh, I'm going to be able to save someone's life because I happen to be in his hotel room, not for any nefarious reason except for that he was having a drug overdose mm -hmm. and God put me there. So that's where he put me. Yeah. And, and, and I, I praise him for that. I would have been miserable doing anything else. Mm -hmm. Not that I haven't been miserable at times doing what I do, but that's where he called me. Yeah. And that's why I've always been able to um, 
embrace people that are different. From, I'm glad I did not grow in, up in the church. Now, I, I know that's going to be a, um, a tough statement for some people to, to deal with. The church is not a building. The church is, is the body of Christ. The church, the, the, the Greek word ekklesia means movement mm -hmm. or, or gathering of believers. But it, there was no building in first century A.D. that they met in. Right. They were, they were, they, there was no such thing. They met in homes. Mm -hmm. They met in catacombs later when they were per being persecuted. Mm -hmm. They met wherever two or three could gather in his name. So we've grown up in the Western world with a bad understanding of what church looks like. And we've, as a result, we tend to stay where we're, we're comfortable. Mm -hmm. We tend to sit in our pews, and I mean pews sometimes, <laughs> year after year after year, right. and, and sending checks for this ministry or that, feeling very, very self-righteous about it. Not that there's anything wrong with sending checks. It's beautiful. It's a, it's a sacrifice mm -hmm. of praise. And, and, and it's, it's tithing. It's all biblical. But when we don't look outside of our church walls through those windows and those doors to the world, mm -hmm. the cosmos, we are not servicing the kingdom of God. And I think that that's part of the real beautiful journey that Christ has had you on to be able to be honest in these different environments where he's placed you in in really special ways whether it was in the entertainment industry or in these quiet conversations that you've had in your home that you describe in your book that it is these honest conversations that you've had with people that has allowed for them to pull back the veil of their heart and to say here's all of my pain what do i do with it or here's all my pain here's what jesus did do with it. Th that whole idea of Jesus placing you in unique um, kind of locations in people's I'm like, lives. Waldo. Yeah. <laughs> what am I doing there? <laughs> right. This is like we're all, you know, this, this book is a journey to find out, well, where did Kathy go next with these people? And I do wonder, as you talked with these friends of yours that are both old and new, that that kind of topic of pain and suffering yes, it's and present wandering. in everyone's life, isn't it? It came up constantly. Yes, it's a theme. And so how how did you walk alongside of some of those friends? I mean, what are some of those stories that really stand out in terms of how Christ guided you to just show care and love to them? Well, when you do walk with your Savior God and best friend Yeshua for as many years as I have, mm -hmm. you start to see uh, you start to long to be more like him. Mm -hmm. And and he set the standard for how we are to treat people. And what I think we fail to do, Philip, is more than we should, is, is that we don't listen as much as we have. I'm gonna tell them, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I've got the message of salvation and I'm gonna stuff it down their throat. I can't, they can't leave here without hearing that, you know. How about we just rest, be still, and know that 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 God is God. He is sovereign in all things. And there's no such thing as coincidence. If I'm in a room with somebody, there is, you know, in the Hebrew language, there is no word for coincidence. Mm. It does not exist. Yeah. Because God is either sovereign God or he's not God at all. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sitting in a room or a restaurant or a movie set with somebody and they happen to start this or that, I've, I, so many people start taking the name of the Lord in vain and I go, I'm so sorry, but would you mind very much just, just not taking, not using his name that way. He's a really good friend of mine. Mm. And it would, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. And I go, what? <laughs> they don't even know that they did it. Yeah. And, and I don't say it in a condemning way. It just changes the conversation, changes the, the uh, atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, you do it in love. Speak the truth in the spirit of love with a tender spirit, basically, mm -hmm. Scripture says. Our hearts are right. We want to share the message of salvation. But Jesus said, love one another. Mm -hmm. Love people like I have loved you. That's the way to the kingdom. Right. That's the way. Not to, They don't need to be told they're this, they're that, they're impure, they're that. They know it. Mm -hmm. I have spent my life, 55 years in an industry where everybody's pretty much darn aware of how, how rotten they are to the core. Right. Scripture says all of us have, have fallen short of the glory of God, sinned. And they may not use those words, but mm -hmm. they know they are less than. Yeah. And so when you start to love them and meet them right where they are, and you lean into them, and you say, tell me, tell me what's going on in your life. 
And I've got them at, at like they're prisoners on a set. If I'm a producer, they've got to sit with me. <laughs> if I'm their co-host, we have a lot of breaks. Right. If I'm their co-actress, there are a lot of times you're just sitting around. And so you just pray for, um, and always, I can't do that on my own. You always pray for discernment. Mm -hmm. Lord, lead me. Every morning, even today, and I knew I was going to be doing a series of all day long interviews on a subject I can talk about with not a note in front of me, uh, with people that are like-minded. There are still people that we don't even know sitting in this room who might not be Mm like-minded. And I always say, Lord, whoever I speak to and whoever hears, may it be your truth. Yeah. Because his word never returns void. My words will, Mm. but his truth never returns void. That's right. I read my Bible regularly, but there were times when it felt like I was just reading words on a page. Like I wasn't really hearing from God the way some people talk about. And I wanted more than that. I wanted to do more than just read the Bible. I wanted to experience God's love through his word. But I needed help. Help to hear from God and see His love for me. To better understand God's character and actions. To study the Bible in a way that helped me see the truth more clearly. And when that happened, I started to feel like I was actually hearing from God in the Word. And not just to know what He wants me to do in light of Scripture, but that He loves me. And that love isn't just about me. It's a love that connects me to women like me and women different from me. Women who are trying to live faithfully in our situations. Women who want to understand the Bible and hear from God through it. Women who all want the same thing. To love God with our whole lives. Dig deep into God's Word and know His love for you with the Love God Greatly Bible. Get your copy at lovegodgreatlybible.com today. You know, as I as I listen to you, the passion that you have behind this idea of how you're interacting with people, it's so evident that that scripture that says that God has placed eternity in our hearts, yes. that you're looking for that in people's lives to see where is it that they are recognizing, you know, the oft-used phrase, the God-shaped void right. in their heart. You're, you're, you're staying aware and discerning of where that might be suddenly coming to the forefront of people's minds. And when I finished reading the book and hearing all of these stories, the one phrase that came to my mind is patient spiritual friendship Mm. of what you've shown to people. Because there are some conversations uh, that you had with folks that are recorded in this book where they're far from an understanding of the biblical idea of Yeshua and some that have walked with him for many, many years. But this idea that we can just simply continue to recount the goodness of God using his scripture Mm -hmm. in this kind of patient way, but but we let our patience get tried. Like Sarah, you think? Mm -hmm. Throwing uh, Hagar into uh, Abraham's arms Mm -hmm. because she had run out of patience for God's promises? I do that every day. Yeah. I mean, I don't throw a woman into a man's arms. <laughs> Not yet, but <laughs> give it time. The day is young. <laughs> I'm capable of it. To the point. What the Lord taught me a long time ago, Philip, is that that um, Kathy find common ground with mm. people, because common ground is sacred ground. Mm. And if you can find something that you can talk to just human being to human being about, mm. it leads to. It leads to um, an opening in in uh, the spiritual realms. Mm-hmm. That's what Jesus did. Yeah, he he. That's exactly what he did, and and the, just the power of the way he loved people, how he saw them mm-hmm. as individuals, how he valued women who've never been. They're still to, in this ninety percent of our world today. Women are still devalued. They're not equal to men. They have no power. They're used for sexual purposes and for every every other a horrible thing. Yeah, you know, Jesus changed the world just just one woman at a time, mm-hmm. much less one sinner at a time. And the ones who were loved the most were the ones who were at the at his cross. Mm-hmm. Only one disciple was there, John. And the rest were the women mm-hmm. that he had, had had 
transformed and redeemed and released from possession and and they were the ones that were fearless. Mm-hmm. John was the only one who seemed fearless enough to say, okay, murder me because right. I'm watching my Lord die. Yeah. That's what it meant to stand there and, and sob at the death of the criminal in the Roman terms. Yeah. And then the, the women were the ones who then went to the tomb in the darkness of the early morning before dawn, just so that when the, you know, the, they could anoint the body of mm-hmm. Jesus. They, they knew there was a stone in front of the grave. They, I, I don't think they, they, they knew, God, we got, we're going to get Jesus. Mm-hmm. Somehow God's going to provide. Even though their dreams were shattered, they remembered what he said. You know, I think they remembered. He said, "What? I in a little while I will be gone from you, but then your grief will turn to joy." Mm-hmm. And I think those women, because they had been relieved of, of of so many burdens in their lives and had been loved so purely by a man, first time ever in their life, a man didn't want them for the wrong reasons, and Mary Magdalene is the first one that Jesus appears to. Mm -hmm. And my favorite word in the entire scripture is when Jesus said, Mary. It's beautiful. And that's how she knew it was him. He called her by her name. Because how many times had he said to her, Mary? Right. When he called out the demons, he held her and said, Mary, Mm -hmm. Mary. And if we could just get back to sharing that guy Mm -hmm. with the world, not the one who says you got to go to this, you got to have twenty people get saved every week, you got to give this amount of money, you got to, you know, uh, uh, no. Jesus said, if you love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, Mm -hmm. everything, and you love your neighbor, who's your neighbor? Not just the person who lives next door to us. Every single person on the planet is our neighbor. Mm If we start loving people like that, Philip, what we want to change the world. How about one neighbor right. at a time? It's, it's the opportunity for us to be troublemakers for grace rather than just troublemakers for ourselves. Exactly. He, Jesus was a radical troublemaker. Right. I, was, I love the fact that I was kicked out of the brownies when I was eight. <laughs> I was a troublemaker. <laughs> I got kicked out of Sunday school because I dared question the fact that Jesus cursed the sycamore tree. When I heard that in Sunday school, I said, no, he didn't. Jesus wouldn't curse something he made. Mm. Jesus doesn't curse what he creates, he loves. And the teacher looked at me like, who is this little <laughs> blasphemer? <laughs> you know, I said, I'm sorry, I know it says that, but I don't believe it. Mm. Later in studying rabbinically, I learned, and this is why it's so important to study this way, everybody. The stuff that bothers you in the Bible that you say, Something tells me that's just not right. Trust it or test the spirit. Mm -hmm. So many translations of the Bible are terrible and they're not true. They're not accurate. And when we hold them up as a divine inspired truth of God, it's at our own peril. Mm -hmm. Only the Greek and the Hebrew in their original sources is something that we can put our faith into. Turns out, interestingly enough, that in Jesus's day, first century A.D., Every one of the, um, they weren't trees at the time, they called them trees, but they were sort of um, uh, glorified bushes because Mm -hmm. there was no buildable wood in first century AD. It was a a desert. Mm -hmm. It was a desert. If you read your scriptures, you know that all of the the building materials, the great building materials that were used for like Herod's projects and, and after him were all floated down from where? They were the cedars of Lebanon which is north of Israel. And they were floated down in in rafts and then broken up when they got to Joppa, which is just south of modern day Tel Aviv, and and then taken across land. So so basically there were glorified bushes in the time of Jesus. So the sycamore tree, the fig sycamore tree, which Jesus was walking down that famous road that is still there, uh, right down from the Mount of Olives all the way down through the, the Garden of Gethsemane on both sides to the Kidron Valley with the, with this, with the um, uh, it, Jerusalem just feet from, the, from that spot. Same, it's there. You can walk down. That's where he was on Palm Sunday. It's so thrilling to walk there still. I'm so grateful it's still the same. Mm-hmm. He saw the fig sycamore tree there and was hungry. <laughs> I also love the fact that Scripture says he's human. Yeah. He got hungry. Right. When he met with the Samaritan woman, it was noon, it was hot, 
God, Jesus was hot and thirsty. He experienced everything we did. Yeah. The difference is, of course, he was also God. Mm-hmm. And, and he, he went over to that tree wanting to, to eat fruit from it. And, and there was no fruit, so it, the Bible says he cursed it. And it, it, it shriveled up and died. Well, okay, that's, where, that's what I heard in Sunday school all those years ago. I must have been 12, 11, 12, something like that. Turns out that in first century AD, there was a name in the Hebrew world, in the Jewish world, culture, for every one of those trees. Olive tree represented the Jewish people. Different trees represented different things. The fig sycamore tree stood for something. Guess who it was? Pharisees and the Sadducees. So when Jesus cursed that tree, he was cursing them Mm. for not feeding his people. Yeah. For not being faithful to God's calling on their lives, right? To to feed the people, mm-hmm. give the, not don't put more laws on them, more burdens on them, more than Rome does, more than the Mosaic law does. Don't give them six hundred more laws they have to live under and burden them under there. So when Jesus said, "I will take your burdens, all you who are heavy laden," that's the people Jesus saw. These people who could bear, and they didn't know the word. They weren't allowed to teach, to learn the word. They weren't allowed to study. Mm-hmm. It's important we know what we're reading yeah. and applying to our lives. Yeah, well, You have uh, very intentionally soaked your life with the scriptures. And, and, and you have communicated it both across your living room, you know, the coffee table and, and the dinner table. But then you've also communicated it across the ocean by, you know, taking friends of yours to the land of Israel, to yes. the promised land, so that people could experience it there. And so I just wonder, though, on a regular and daily basis, what encouragement would you give to people that are listening into this conversation? Because it's like it's so evident Like you take the study of the scripture so serious and Mm. it's so personal. And so what encouragement do you give to people about how they engage the Bible on a regular basis? Is it a reading plan? Is it a study plan? Is it just a whatever will work for you plan? Oh, it's it, like Jesus himself. It's, 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 it's unique and individual to every single person. I'm not a formula girl. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. I mean, I want the right formula for my roots. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not stupid. But <laughs> I, uh, I, I just believe if you, the Bible says, seek him and you will find him. Mm-hmm. You know, he has drawn us with everlasting love, Jeremiah says. He wants us to seek him. And that's, it, it's such a beautiful journey for us to be on from what you said toward the beginning of our conversation about that the church is a community, it's not a building, that we're doing this together, we're walking together through it's this. It's a movement, actually, yeah. the church. Oh, yeah. A and because it is Spirit. the called out ones that, mm-hmm. that the Lord has, right. has created us to be. At the end of uh, the Jesus I Know, um, there is, uh, a, as a publisher, I, I look at every little detail. Sure. And, and there's this great appendix at the end of the book that that outlines all the Bible verses that you discuss in each one of those conversations. It's just like this added little bonus of, you know, the conversation you had with Megan Kelly, here are the Bible verses, the conversation you had with Brian Welch, heavy metal band member mm-hmm. from Love, Corn. Yeah. You know, here's the conversation, uh, your daughter, your friends that are close to Jesus, that are just learning about Jesus. And so right now in your life, as you think about what God's been doing lately for you, as we wrap up this conversation, what are the passages of Scripture that have just been filling your heart with, with great joy and with great abundance? What mm. encouragement would you leave with us about where God has been feeding you just deeply right now? Oh, what a great question. You know, for the longest time, it was... Um... It was Philippians 4.13 was my like go-to. I can do all things through. I had a friend who used to make me beautiful art things that I could frame. No matter, I could do Broadway. I can do the Scandalous through Christ who strengthens me. I can do the Today Show through Christ who strengthens me. I can, somebody then said a great translation of it also is, I can do all seasons mm-hmm. through Christ who strengthens me. And, and I love that because I'm in a brand new season of my life. We run out of seasons. Lamentations talks about for every 
to everything there in, there is a purpose in life right. and time for everything under under God's heavens and and I'm a widow now for 6 years my children are raised and 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 thriving in in in, in the Lord thank you oh that what is it first first John 4 says that I have no greater joy than to to know that my children walk in truth yeah yeah it the children of God yes but it's also personal to me mm-hmm. my children walk in truth and I'm so grateful for that so things like that that hit home to me yeah you know uh, not the greater, not the ones, um, yes, God so loved the world. Then when I learned that the word means co- cosmos, mm-hmm. everything that he's created, including every one that he's created. I, scriptures now come to life to me once I understand what the words actually mean. Yeah. The, Paul didn't say, wives don't, you must submit to your husbands. How many times has that been misused in our culture through centuries and centuries and kept women in bondage to to ungodly marriages Mm -hmm. where they had all kinds of biblical rights to leave it? But no, you got to submit. The word is hippotasso in the Greek. And you know what it means? To reach down and lift up. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. It's not servitude. It's not... um, uh, slavery. It's not any of those things. The man actually is the much tougher thing. It does say, love the church the way Jesus did and give your life for it. Yeah. You guys have a harder <laughs> road to you know, travel yeah. than, than we do. But I, I, wanna re- I want people to know what it says so they're released from the bondage. Scripture should not put us in chains. Religion puts us in chains. Mm-hmm. Relationship with the living God t- frees us from all of them. Yeah. All of them. Amen. And that's a great note for us to close our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a joy to hear uh, how Jesus has been working in your life. Thank you so much. What time is it? He ain't finished yet. (laughs) Thank you. Lord bless you. Thank you.